said hello to the world of film with grace, nuance, and charm. I think sometimes the miracles of cinema, the things that really change the industry, aren't so obvious from the surface. It's the ripples they leave in the water. You need to see the echoes of The Thing, the innocuous roach movie starring Jerry O'Connell, to see what waves this tiny movie put in the water. It's kind of staggering. You can follow a ripple to indie powerhouse election just as easily as you could follow one to CGI blockbuster Ice Age. This movie did a lot of things. Joe's apartment. I made this show for this moment. Shush. Joe's apartment is a 1996 film that came out the exact same day as A Time to Kill, the film that won that weekend. Kingpin and Super Cop also opened. It made less money than The Hunchback of Notre Dame's sixth week at the box office. 96 was a banger summer, my friends. Independence Day has been out for four weeks, and ID4 is the movie of the season. The box office in summer 1996 is a street fight, and the whole neighborhood was invited. We got Eraser, The Long Kiss Goodnight, and The Rock that year. How is Joe's Apartment, a movie from a tiny cable spin-off film studio, supposed to compete with that. The film, itself based on the three-minute short film Interstitial from 1992 on MTV, these bumpers are something of an artifact from the heyday of basic cable. Created to bridge gaps in scheduling, a lot of networks used these, and Adult Swim really refined the concept in the early 2000s, but I digress. So John Payson created this somewhat crude, extremely Gen X story of a guy who lives with a bunch of roaches. It is as adorable as it is terrifying. You are in on the joke. Also, they sing. Garbage. 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 <laughs> How charming. The idea for a film based on a short came about when MTV was exploring the idea of producing feature films based on their television IPs. They partnered with Geffen Pictures and Warner Brothers to produce and release their first two films, one based on the three-minute singing road short and drumroll. Beavis, Beavis and Butthead, the, those guys. Joe's apartment is given the impossible task of stretching a three minute TV short into a feature film starring Jerry O'Connell. Pop a squat on that curb top and have yourself a sit down, dude. The best way to talk about this film's plot is simply to describe it in plain, everyday English so the heart of our true story may emerge. Ahem. Joe is a couch waste boy who doesn't have aspirations or skills in the, you know, truest sense. He is also aggressively disgusting at a rate that would repel anyone but a cockroach, and therein lies our premise. Can Joe and his sophomore roommates, who are also bugs, land on their feet in this rent-controlled apartment where the previous tenant was murdered by the landlord because a billionaire is trying to build a high-rise apartment on a lot where he had just killed the last tenant? I need more commas. Joe pretends to be her son because he already made the decision to move to New York and he can't afford to live anywhere else, nor can the roaches for that matter, which is directly at odds with the property owner who needs them to leave to build his 1990s high-raise super prison. 90s cynicism hits different, y'all. There was this popular plot tactic in the 90s comedy scene where the leading men would offer nothing and then lie their way into the most baller position in the world. Radical. This is a movie about Joe lying to everyone, even and especially to himself. Despite the three-minute sketch being turned into a hastily held-together feature film, there is something to the cyclical nature of time. We are still complaining about landlords who don't especially want to house people as a business as much as nickel and dime them into obscurity and death. Did Gen Z write this movie? Shoot. You should see me in a crowd. The love interest runs a community garden? Her father is the one who wants to build the prison system and murder his tenants. Somebody alert TikTok! 
And Joe's apartment did stumble out the gate, causing consternation and doubt that MTV could make a sizable impact in the film industry. Siskel and Ebert even gave it a very enthusiastic two thumbs down. The basic cable to movie studio pipeline was still in its infancy, after all. Gene Siskel, in his review for the movie called MTV's first film, a would-be comedy. Ebert, likewise, seemed pretty upset about the urinal cakes to give you additional perspective. And I didn't like the garbage, and I didn't like the urinal cakes, which supply a very large part of the plot. This isn't inspired. I guess what I'm trying to do it's is... Dumb. I'm trying to give... It's not a clever I'm, I'm trying to... Ebert, among reasonable criticism that the film was just gross, I think fell short when he said the film wasn't clever. Joe's apartment is still true now. Wow, real estate owners doing everything they can to evict or outright kill tenants in rent-controlled apartments in favor of a more profitable business? Joe is a slacker dude in his 20s with no money and no aspirations and is pretty okay with roaches because he was gross to begin with. The roaches love Joe. I hate that I'm dunking on Ebert in 1996, but the love story, sir, was between Joe and the roaches, not Joe and the person whose garden gets burned down by property management hitmen. Glad I could clear up this hotly debated film issue. This happens in the original short too. Roaches in New York try to get the grossest but endearingly cute man a date. But Joe's leaves MTV Studios in a tight spot with even more writing on their follow-up films, especially considering this movie left no visible impact upon release. It was kind of a bomb. Which is where the story gets very interesting, actually. Rip MTV in the 1990s is an evolving idea. You do that as a TV network, especially as a cable network. From breakout success all of the 1980s to suddenly watching the music industry progress around them. It was unquestionably a hotly debated topic my whole goddamned life. That MTV was better when it played music. Well, sit down. This is a prejudiced framing of the whole situation. MTV played less music and music videos over time because more stations play music now on all kinds of platforms. This is right before Napster is about to take over the whole world as the 90s come to a close. MTV films came to ball because they had to. The MTV brand was very much about allowing teens and young adults to speak for themselves at a time when TV didn't look like that. The idea is to take the energy into the world of film and team up with interesting filmmakers along the way. David Geffen was the first person to call Viacom CEO Tom Freston the morning after Beavis and Butthead premiered in 1993 to pitch a movie idea, which, in his mind, stars hot SNL actors in live action David Spade and Adam Sandler. While this train wreck is being developed, MTV's parent company Viacom acquires Paramount Pictures, so now the Beavis and Butthead movie will be developed by Paramount Pictures instead of Warner Brothers' original pan to bookend Joe's apartment. Series creator Mike Judge is rightfully upset about all of this, and sort of also inherits an ad hoc animated movie that they were figuring out how to make on the fly. TV and film are very different beasts for now. So this whole movie is a learning experiment for the crew in terms of telling a story in the cinematic landscape. And first of all, the soundtrack for this movie burns the absolute doors off. The 1990s was sort of a golden era for the film soundtrack, like there is no reason the Spawn soundtrack should go that hard. Be 
Stevenson butthead do America is a 70s road trip movie across America. It is a low-key miracle, but also kind of fundamentally changes the film industry. It also made back five times its budget, which is quite a change from Joe's. And the run of films they are about to go on is an eclectic array of movies that are all over the place. They would put every label in the Viacom and Paramount arsenal down as the production company depending on what would be the most suitable for the project. Comedy Central films? Nickelodeon films? Let's go! different masks for what is ostensibly the exact same production company. And I'm gonna blow your mind, cause here is the run of late 90s and early 2000s films they went on. Ahem. Joe's Apartment, Beavis and Butthead, Varsity Blues, 200 Cigarettes, Election, South Park, Bigger, Longer and Uncut, The Wood, The Original Kings of Comedy, Save the Last Dance, Pootie Tang, Zoolander, Orange County, Crossroads, Jackass the Movie, Better Luck Tomorrow, which coincidentally is also the first appearance of Han's character from the Fast and Furious franchise, cap that list off with Napoleon Dynamite in 2004, a film that cost $400,000 and grossed $46 million million dollars at the box office. Those are Blair Witch numbers! This was not a normal movie studio. They certainly didn't make all hits. I mean, all you really have to do is look at 2005's Eon Flux that lost a cool 10 million on the process, but most of these productions are still wildly memorable films. They ultimately ran out of steam and live off the Jackass brand for the rest of their life. But there's some concert films they put out that were pretty good. Minus Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. I think they really start to lessen their output over the 2010s. MTV Films formally ceased operations in 2020 when it was absorbed into MTV Entertainment Studios, which is still producing movies today. Though mainly for streaming and heavily documentary focused, MTV Films changed the industry. They did what they set out to do, make film a little less stuffy and a little more friendly for the disaffected teens in the back because they kind of need someone on their team, which is what MTV was always supposed to be. When looking at the history of something like a film studio, you really have to look at two things. One, the output of the studio needs to speak for itself first and foremost. Two, you need to look at the consolidation of entertainment studios happening within their bubble and how it affects them. MTV Films forms out of nothing, and the first two films were really just figuring out how to make them. MTV thought they were getting a live-action Beavis and Butthead hit 400 brick walls and just threw it at Mike Judge like, Hey, we need to figure out how to make a movie and stuff, but like, real fast. Mike Judge is one of the only ripples that came from MTV Films that's still putting out bangers. He saves the studio with Beavis and Butthead and then follows that up with Office Space and Idiocracy. MTV launched a lot of careers in film. They were affecting how the next generation of filmmakers would make movies. The inspired and underfunded became the inspiration. Here's a cool thing about time. You can't fake being influential. Time will prove you out one way or the other, and this is worth making a video to acknowledge the people behind the scenes. MTV Films is a separate thing when they make Joes, but by 2003 they're folded into the production group within MTV making the shows Beavis and Butthead, My Super Sweet 16, and Clone High, baby! When you consider Pootie Tang in this context, I think it makes more sense. Strange. Nowadays, they're mostly a distributor, itself an arm of Paramount Global, who will be owned, merged with, sometime in the near future. God knows they're trying. Not to quote myself from the last video, the life of a film studio ends when a tech company buys you. Okay, this one's out there, but when Microsoft buys Paramount, I want 100,000 likes on this video. I'm in the film Nostradamus business now, and the film industry is experiencing Armageddon. 
I want to put a finer point on the arm flailing I've been doing since 2020. I make a piece highlighting a pocket of creative output that not only gave people jobs, it challenged the system itself. We're erasing these pockets of artistic output in real time with the world's steadfast belief that you can own all the toys. And that will make you win. So I'm going to separate the business entirely on this one. Dear Hollywood system. The people you are hurting are the people that built you. If your business is selling art, then keeping those artists safe and secure should be the paramount objective. Yes, I see what I did there. The ripples are forming in the industry, but they are forming inside the structure itself, and it is crumbling the buildings. So in the end, I'm eulogizing something that formed out of necessity and ended up altering the fabric of the film industry. But I'm also eulogizing the ripples because they too perished. Hmm. Apropos of everything, remember Blue Sky Animation from part one? What's important to note here is that they had been doing TV commercials for all kinds of companies at the start of the 90s. That's their business. They invented the CGI M&M. Heck, they were working with Gillette and Pepsi at this point. But they take the contract to be one of the methods for special effects for Joe's Apartment's cockroaches in 1995. And in 1997, 20th Century Fox is so dang impressed with the expressive CG cockroaches that they acquire Blue Sky through their LA VFX house, VIFX, VFX, VFX, I don't know, it's one of those pirates. This new duplex of effects houses even does effects in Alien Resurrection and Fight Club. The 20th century VFIX company decouples from Blue Sky and is sold to Rhythm and Hughes, RIP. Blue Sky is kept with 20th century as it is retooled to think about a feature film. They almost get sold as well because the early 2000s were not great for special effects houses. And it is this little script floating around 20th century Fox called Ice Age that saves them. And it's the 2019 Disney acquisition of 20th Century that closes Blue Sky. <laughs> Get ready for this! The feature film they were working on when it closed? Nimona. Maybe all the comments should be, hey, but Mikey, make that video on Nimona already. That story sure sounds juicy, and it is. It's the small studios we lose along the way. Blue Sky died as it lived. MTV Films died as it lived. Every ripple from Joe's Apartment, a movie pretty much no one remembers, is now erased by treacherous seas. Eventually, all of the ripples begin to collide with each other, chopping up the waves. Though the film executives are all safe, nestled on their yachts. In rough seas, it is the artists who begin to drown. Hello, friends. Uh, here is a quick message from Filmjoy, Mikey and Tara. Uh, please join our Patreon. It's how we stay alive. And it's, it's you know, I, I hate this part because I feel like I'm always like, so a hundred horrible things happen to us. Um, but we made art through all of it. Uh, you can probably just Google Film Joy Catastrophe and find out. Losing our house, moving to California. Anyway, Patreon keeps Film Joy going. Uh, we love talking about movies. We love talking about what we love about movies. And we'd love to see you on our Discord or in the credits for Movies with Mikey, which are right now. 